And now, my friends, lights, camera, in action, because to see these great movies, you don't even need to leave your front room. Serious business now. Three Freeview film recommendations from one of our leading film critics, Fan Connor. Three for me. Not so much of a film critic, but certainly somebody who loves his movies. And I've scoured the preview schedules, and I've come up with three, I think, very different but rather good films. Van, though, once again, has come up with three blinders, one of which I've heard a lot about but never seen. He's got his three recommendations. But first, Van, how's the week been for you, mate? What have you been up to? Have you seen any big new movies that you can't tell us a, your view on, but you can kind of get their mouths watering a bit? Because there's loads coming our way. They're like the light year films out this weekend, I think. And isn't the new Thor film on the way fairly soon? Yeah, the new Thor is, I think, it's a fortnight away. I will tell you, though, that light year so far is my favourite movie of this this year and that sounds insane but i'm being completely genuine and a lot of critics have, have kind of poo-pooed it but i can't wait to see it i mean i, mean, I think it's kind of you know, unless they can really fumble the ball with avengers i can't see how it can fail well you know that joke about how buzz lightyear you know thinks that he's this insane space ranger it's that movie of what what if he actually was genuine what 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 would that be based on and it's based on the sort of flash gordon kept version of, of buzz lightyear voiced by chris evans it's a wild ride it's like interstellar for kids it's insane i love it i whooped i cheered i even cried twice oh sweet now there has been a degree of controversy about it of course and we, we talked about this on the program earlier in the week because mm. it's been banned in some i think middle eastern countries because it features pixar's first gay kiss between two female characters yeah, it's been banned in four countries that i've actually lived in which is disheartening it, it's a really good movie and you get to that bit there was a moment in the movie when when, when that was unveiled and you're like yeah there's, there's no way they're going to be able to clip this out for china this time and uh, yeah the new story's you know pretty much dropped the second we got out of that first screening. Not terribly surprising, but a problem that Disney keeps finding, especially with their animated films in the last couple of years. I know this happened with the Onward, I think, briefly, oh, right, Ryan yes. the Last Dragon, I think, tiptoed around it as well. Now, we've also got some preview film recommendations for you that are coming up very soon indeed. You won't need to pay extra for Starting with one that uh, I saw it, didn't really get it, saw it again, thoroughly enjoyed it. Tell us about Pineapple Express, please. I, I mean, it's one of those films, if you're, you're inebriated when you watch it, it, it adds a lot to the experience, given that's kind of its subject matter. So it stars Seth Rogen as a process of, just for the record, this was made in 2008. So there is a cultural shift that has to be factored in with this movie. So this made in 2008. Seth Rogen's a process of, uh, uh, who's really into his weed. And he goes around and he gets his weed every day from uh, James Franco, a, a dealer played by James Franco. Uh, he accidentally witnesses a murder and finds himself on the run from corrupt cop Corrupt, corrupt cops, evil drug dealers, and I think the the the, the, the triad as well, uh, forced to uh, basically go on the run with his dealer when the only thing tying them to the crime is in fact a, a unique strain of weed. It was it was the first so-called weed action movie. It was an early effort from Seth Rogen and his partner Evan Goldberg as well. It's I think the first uh, cinematic team up between Franco and and Rogen, and it's uh, it's got also a cast that includes Gary Cole, Danny McBride. Uh, Tim Meadows, the brilliant Bill Hader, and uh, in our clip that you'll hear in a moment, Amber Heard, uh, as well as Seth Rogen's uh, underage girlfriend. This was a lot funnier in 2008, j just just for the record. Um, the movie has changed its perspective somewhat because obviously in the US, cannabis has been legalized to a certain extent within the last sort of five or six years. So a lot of the humor doesn't quite work to Americans. But for us here in Britain, the film is just as timeless as it was. You can see this tonight on great movies at 9pm. It is hilarious. It's worth it just for the opening uh, sequence of, of Bill Hader trying trying smoking for the first time, which is just an amazing scene. Um, really funny, really quotable. One of the best of that year. So it's Pineapple Express tonight 9pm on Great Movies. And I've got a clip for you of Rogan trying to get his girlfriend and her parents to join him in fleeing to safety. Here we go. It's called Pineapple Express. Here's the clip. We should call the police right away. We can't call the police. The police oh. were the murderers. That's what's we so can't call the flipping police. They scary. Were the they were the murderers. Don't Angie, you? I swear to God, you, do, you do something or I'm going to. So no, don't. Don't let him gonna. No, don't want to. Look, we got to get the F out of here. Let's go. We need to begin to prematurely evacuate. Are you high? What? No, I'm not high. What? You are high as a kite. I'm not high. Let's go. We're not going anywhere. I'm coming back in a minute. You know what I'm coming back with? No, what? I'm coming back with a gun. You better be out of here. Robert, don't. I'm not with you. 
I was kind of confused by because I was expecting a straight ahead. I know I shouldn't have done with Seth Rogen's thing. <laughs> I, I was expecting a straight ahead action film, but it was it's a very funny film. It's if as you've just heard there, ever so slightly on the foul mouth side. But you know we're my head up here. It's late at night when it's shown. Seth Rogen. <laughs> my film is also a late night offering. It's tonight on BBC One. It's been around on the small screen for a while now, based on a comic book uh, created by John Romita Jr., a great artist, and Mark Miller, one of our mm. finest comic book artists. Well, I say ours. He's of Scottish heritage. Mark Miller's done, Mark Miller's done a really brilliant job in this, I think, because it's basically about a wannabe superhero who decides I'm going to be a superhero and bumps into other self-created superheroes, none of whom, except maybe one, because you've got a massive brain, have got any real powers, just determination, courage, and suits that seem to be able to do all great blows that they don't kind of get knocked out by. You've got Kick-Ass himself, great name for hero, you've got Hit-Girl, and you've got Nicolas Cage... I mean, what a great performance from Nick Cage as a kind of Batman type figure called Big Daddy. Great film. This action romps all the way. Did very well at the box office. Enough to uh, mm. inspire a sequel, which wasn't as good, partly because Matthew Vaughan didn't direct it, and my sister-in-law Jane Goldman didn't co-write it. There you go. <laughs> one for the family once again. You must have enjoyed this one. It was came out in 2010. Now, where have those 12 years gone? Oh, I know. This is this is a thought again. We kind of forget this one. This was one of the breakout roles of Chloe Moretz, yeah. as well, all the way back then when she was a child actress. It was this and let the right one in i think around the let, let me in the remake yeah. sorry um around the same time that she sort of broke out on as this foul mouthed google assassin and foul mouth but nicholas with a, cage with a, absolutely steeled it and foul mouth with a capital f because one of the words she had oh, yeah. provoked a great degree of controversy at the time and she actually said if i was to use any of the language my character did in real life i'll be grounded for eternity by my parents which is quite sweet so we've got the trailer I, for you um, oh sorry go on I, I was just, just going to say, I interviewed Mark Miller at uni when this film was in development. When I was in uni radio, I interviewed Miller at, uh, at Thought Bubble in Leeds. And he actually revealed that line that you just referred to from Chloe Moretz. That was the audition line. So he took great pride in having parents line up their like eight to ten year old daughters in a line and actually quote that line one after another to see who was best for the role. So just, just imagine that day in the studio. That, that sounds like a fun one. Okay, thank you. The film's called Kick Ass. It's from 2010, 2020, 2010, 20 to midnight tonight. It's on on BBC One. If you can't stay out that late or out and about or listening to, you know, talk sports and then after, of course, MK Don himself, Martin Kellner, make sure you record it or download it. It's an absolute belter. And here's the trailer. Forms, money. We see someone in trouble and wish we could help. Who are you looking at, huh? But we don't. How come nobody's ever tried to be a superhero? You want to go fight some crime? Let's see what you can do. Oh, that kind of hurt. Costume vigilante has become the latest internet phenomenon. Bring it on! You're crazy, kid. Hey, I have one of those. Who are you? Kick ass. Red Mist. I'm Hit Girl. That's Sweet Daddy. Red Mist, what a great name for a character. Of course, I'm just being told that the Golden State Warriors have clinched this season's NBA championship. So there you go, breaking news for the world of basketball. Meanwhile, back to Van Conner's second film recommendation. Tell us about A Simple Favour. I misremembered this as the kids' film A Simple Wish. It's not that at all, is it? Uh, n not, not the same at all. No, 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 no. no. Very, very A million miles from that rather cutesy uh, kids' classic. <laughs> very, ever so slight. So this stars Blake Lively and Anna Kendrick, uh, along with uh, then relatively unknown Henry Golding as well, uh, in a, a strange deviation from, from Paul Feig. So Paul Feig uh, taking a break from comedy to go into something of an adult R-rated psychosexual thriller about uh, a, a, a would-be YouTube blogger, a YouTube blogger mum played by Kendrick, who befriends another mum played by Blake Lively, who is just odd. She dresses in, like, really sick-ass power suits, and she's, she's full of attitude and sass, and one day she asks a simple favour. She asks Kendrick to look after her daughter and then goes missing. Yeah. And the mystery becomes what happened to her friend. And as Kendrick starts to get to know Blake Lively's husband, uh, uh, Henry Golding, and starts to learn more about her life, she realises that in actuality, she knew very, very little about her friend. And the person that she's discovering all these things about in no way is the person she met. There may be more to it than that. But say, uh, BBC One, uh, 1020, Saturday night, perfect time for this. It's a great date movie. It's a great one to watch with the guys. It's a great one to watch with the girls. It, it's it's one of those movies that kind of works for all occasions. Um, obviously above a certain age threshold, but it just works as a great, fun, schlocky thriller. Good fun from Kendrick and Blake Lively. Just choose this scenery like it's bubblegum. I absolutely loved it. Um, it's worth it just for Lively in those.
those outfits. Those outfits are just <laughs> insane. If you've never seen it, Paul, you will absolutely love this. It is just a ride. So 10 to 20 on BBC One. I've got a clip for you. And this is, this is Blake Lively giving Kendrick some of that signature sass. Here we go. The drink? I need a martini. Oh, uh, yeah, I like martinis. I haven't had one in a, a long time. They're good, though. I had one that was, like, mostly chocolate, and I was like, alcohol and chocolate. <laughs> Come on, life. Oh, okay. No play date. Come on, kid. Let's go. Then I'm staying here. I think I could use some backup. Th- that's me? I'm backup? Does your kid drink? Maybe? I mean, it's never too early to, to start teaching. I him. think you're joking, but great. Interesting film this is. I'm looking forward to seeing it. I did see it first time around. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it again. And I'm also looking forward to seeing what is probably my favourite science fiction film of this century. I've seen June now a couple of times. I love that. I'm waiting for the other two to be on the next set instalment, rather, the, the, the finishing part of the uh, film to make my mind. I enjoyed Blade Runner 2049. I preferred Arrival, though, which is on tomorrow night on Channel 4. Mm. It's on at, well, it's on at uh, 40 minutes past midnight, 20 to 1, so it creeps into Sunday morning, but I think it's more you'll be up from Saturday night. Amy Adams is fantastic in it. Forrest Whitaker's great in it. Jeremy Renner's fantastic in it. And it's based on a Ted Chang short novel called Story of Your Life, which was published at the back end of the last century. It's also worth reading. I mean, it's a, he's an amazing writer, Ted Chang. And it's basically about these remarkable-looking alien craft that turn up, not like anything you've probably seen before in science fiction films. Creatures on board whom you never quite get to see. And Amy Adams is summoned from her kind of academic life to to translate or to try and work out what these creatures are trying to say to us. Whether in fact threats to humanity and whether other countries around the world have managed to decipher this alien lingo and come up with, I don't know, super weapons. So it's about mankind's paranoia. Are we ready to meet strangers? And also some amazing special effects and a really... It's a, it stayed with me, this film. I don't know what you made of this, man. It stayed with me, this movie, in a way that even, I must say, June didn't, because I know the book so well. And in the end, I think it was maybe slightly too pompous and po-faced. Some of the humour from the book is missing. Brave Runner 2049 was great, but nothing could be as good as the original. This has got a real cinematic resonance for me, this film. No, I mean, it's like any film that's got Denis Villeneuve behind, behind the camera. He, he's just... It's just a, a, a wonderful sci-fi vision. It's one of those that I, I think succeeds largely in not kowtowing at all it's as regards the, the the intensity of the science fiction, the science in the science fiction, effectively. It really leans into the science of that term and the way that it handles the basic concept. You, you see a million like sci-fi things. Star Trek, obviously, prime example. They show up on a planet, they speak to people, they leave. And this is, well, yes, but the effort here is in how do you speak to people? Yeah. And the idea that you can make an entire story out of that and make one this suspenseful and this twisty and turny is incredible, that you then get a cast as good as you've got here. To then work on that results in something absolutely tremendous. Amy Adams, Jeremy Renner, uh, uh, Forrest Whitaker, as you point out, all tremendous across the board. I'm glad they did change the title because it's kind of a spoiler in a sense. Yeah, yeah. Like once you once you've seen the full film, it's a bit of a spoiler. But um, but I really like it, and I think visually, as you say, it's like it's, it's like nothing else you've ever seen. The aliens themselves are such a great and inventive design. I'm glad they've done something other than that ridiculous Cloverfield uh, green grey. Even Independence Day. Those kind, of, those, those kind of monsters. Yeah. That. I mean, they're, they're, it's all right in a kind of bubblegum shoot em up science fiction film. The other thing I liked about this film was it wasn't until I'd seen it, I think, the second time after a few months that I actually registered how great the special effects were because it's such an intense human drama as well, really, isn't it? I mean, it could be... It, it doesn't have to be aliens, and you don't see... I mean, you see enough of them to realise these are, like, really alien aliens. They're not bipeds, we mm. don't think, and they're not... But also... Matter of fact, things like them floating into this magnificent, vast, but almost empty looking spaceship, kind of jaw dropping special effects, because often they're, they're sparseness. You know, there's not, the money's not on the screen, the studio might have said about this one. Well, like I say, it is, I mean, as you say, it is like nothing you've ever seen before. It is a very unique vision of first contact and the fact that they use non-humanoid aliens which is something films very very rarely do actually because it's easier to do a standard arms and a legs and a head sort of an alien yeah. for, for the purposes of audiences um, but I don't want to get bogged down in the sci-fi no. stuff I do think though Arrival you, when you say it's your favourite sci-fi movie of, of this century I, I can understand that completely fantastic stuff it's on channel 4 it's at 40 minutes past midnight 20 to 1 into Sunday morning but don't hold that against me from 2016 and there's a chunk of the trailer you've, you've been told about the setups. This is quite impressionistic, but it should get you intrigued. If you've not seen this, please give it a chance. We need to make sure that they understand the difference between a weapon and a tool. Language is messy, and sometimes one can be both. Are you dreaming in their language? It's 
possible. They're prodding us to fight among ourselves. This is just a way to force us to work together for once. It's more complicated than that. How is it more complicated? Russia just executed one of their own to keep their secret. Got 21 hours to form base our global war. So how do we clarify their intentions? I go back in. Why does this feel worse? And it may have been intentional. It's in the, the, the short novel, but it really echoes the scene in Hurt Locker, one scene when Amy Adams takes off her kind of protective suit in the way that Jeremy Renner's character does in Hurt Locker when he realises he can't defuse the bomb wearing all this gear. So it's a great, I mean, tension is there. It's thought-provoking and it looks fantastic. I'd urge you to catch it, folks. It's my big recommendation for the weekend. And then I've got one. It's an old favourite. It's like an old friend. I don't have to see it from the beginning. I could dive at any point. I will then watch it to the end if I've got the time. And it was released, first of all, in 1977, directed by... Sir Richard Attenborough, written by that double Oscar winning screenplay writer, um, William Goldman, adapted from the true, the history book, basically, by popular history book by Cornelius Ryan. It is, of course, the story of Operation Market Garden. It's a bridge too far. This should almost be compulsorily only shown on bank holidays, I think, Ben. What do you reckon? It's a great old <laughs> wolf. I mean, the cast is astonishing in this film, isn't it? I mean, off the top of my head, Gene Hackman, Robert Redford, you've got, um, Michael Caine, Edward Fox turns, or James Fox, rather, Edward Fox turns up in it. I mean, Ed, Dirk Bogart, of course, acting his socks off as a very camp, kind of based on a man he actually served under, English general. And it's got a great story, and it's also that one of those films where you kind of think, did this actually happen? And William Goldman, in his book, mm. Adventure in the Screen Trade, said, I had to actually tone down some of the heroism, because the studio didn't believe it had happened. So what you see isn't just the bravery of these men, it's a diluted version of it. It's a really fantastic film, this old-fashioned but fantastic I'm with you, yeah. It does seem like the kind of thing that should be shown exclusively yeah. on bank holders. I know that's the only time I've ever watched it. And that great line, almost final line in the film, I think it might be the final line from Dirk Bogart. Well, I always thought we tried to go a bridge too far. Just fantastic stuff. Yeah. So I've got the trailer. Uh, the cast, as I say, is stellar. Some of them only pop up for three or four minutes, but they're all, they're all based on real life people, real life characters. Many of whom were alive still when the film was first made and shown. It's on Sunday afternoon, Channel 5, 10 to 3. You might as well record it and we saw the adverts. You may have it already on VHS or DVD from 1977. Are they really trying to go a bridge too far? The plan is called Operation Market Garden. Market is the airborne element and garden the ground forces. I like to think of this as one of those American Western films. Germans will naturally, they're the bad guys. We, my friends, are the cavalry on the way to the rescue. A Bridge Too Far. Starring Dirk Bogart, James Kahn, Michael Caine, Sean Connery, Edward Fox, Elliot Gould, Gene Hackman, Anthony Hopkins, Hardy Kruger, Laurence Olivier, Ryan O'Neill, Robert Redford, Maximilian Schell, Leave Ullman. Take cover! Did he mention Sir Lawrence Olivier? I got lost in the middle of that one. I mean, that is a cast to die for, isn't it? Sean Con yeah, I think Sean Connery got a special billing, and I think he says something at the end, and featuring Sean Connery, because uh, um, they did it alphabetically, I think was the deal, apart from Sean Connery, I, think, I seem to remember. And your final film is a great, and as always with you, you always pick one that I'd never seen come in, and the one I'd never seen come in is Poison Ivy. Tell us about your Sunday recommendation, if you would, please, Van. Right, I'm just going to admit, like this, a lot of this is is guilty pleasure on my part. Yeah. I have such a, a thing for this movie. It, it was part of a wave of early '90s films. Early '90s loved a sexy, evil, psycho teenage girl in a thriller. That was that was one of the templates. Alicia Silverstone's career started with that uh, in in The Crush in 1994. Uh, 1995, I, 94, 95, I think. This was 92, and this was Drew Barrymore's one. And I think she's about 17 or 18 when she made this. She was largely known at that point as being the little girl from E.T., yeah. and then the slightly older little girl from Firestarter. She then became the slightly older teenager in Poison Ivy in which she is the uh, the psycho best friend who worms her way into Sarah Gilbert from Roseanne's family unit and starts to basically usurp the maternal figure and 
with designs on seducing the dad, played by Tom Skerritt. Uh, this is a, just before he started doing picket fences on TV. Um, great role for Sarah Gilbert, who, like I say, was known really as a sitcom actress at that point for Roseanne. Uh, this is her sort of stepping out of a comfort zone, her sort of film efforts. You know, like when, when they start in the sitcom, they start to step out and do their own sort of feature yeah. uh, vehicles. This was hers. And uh, she actually is the central figure. Even though Drew Barrymore gets the billing, it is Sarah Gilbert's film. It is from her perspective. It's something we have in years since we've seen uh, a lot. Early effort from Cat Shea, who wound up uh, going on to directing mostly kind of schlock after this, because the film wasn't really well received and hasn't really garnered much of a legacy beyond a series of increasingly poor, like diminishingly poor, uh, director video sequels, including 1996's Poison Ivy 2, Lily, starring uh, uh, Alyssa Milano, of all people. And it's, it's literally still going today. I think they're rebooting it. Is it like the Leprechaun uh, franchise? The they constantly release Leprechaun films still, don't they? All, uh, nobody, they, you know, they're straight to video, straight to DVD, straight to streaming. There's obviously an audience for them, a market for them. Well, there really is. But unlike the Leprechaun franchise, sadly, they're not going to reboot Poison Ivy using someone from the WWE, because I'll be really, really honest, I'm I'm here for that. If you want to get Becky Lynch to to reboot Poison Ivy, I'm I'm in. That'd be a great movie, and I'm down. But sadly, Seamus and Leprechauns as far as we're going to get on that one uh, at, at the moment. Sorry, Hornswoggle and Leprechaun. Sorry, Seamus. Uh, but Poison Ivy, the first and unquestionably the best of the Poison Ivy. You might, you might think the best best of a bad bunch, but me and Van couldn't possibly comment yeah. on that. But you, you might use the word schlock, and I think that's what it is. Which is every now and again, it's nice to have a great big bowl of schlock isn't it a bit of fun trash and everyone likes a bit of trashy fun you know and poison ivy sunday night 10 past nine on five star i think that's the perfect one to round off the weekend with enjoy some schlock get some trashy fun round out the weekend with poison ivy so 10 past 11 on five star i've got a clip for you and this is uh, this is ivy being introduced to her new friend's dad be afraid be very afraid here we go hi mm. it's nice and cool in here um, I missed my ride. Think you could take me to Olympic in Fairfax? No. Just a sec. Dad, she's my best friend. Why didn't you think of that before? Oh, come on, just this once, please, and then I'll be grounded forever. What's your name? Ivy. Oh, great. Good Lord. Get in. It's the kind of film that is now made for TV and turns up on five proper on an afternoon in weekdays, yeah. doesn't it? About the kind of never let somebody else in your house. All these women are conniving against you and they'll frame you for murder and what? kill your husband. Yeah, it's like a 15 in, two, in, in 1992. This is like a PG by today's standards, but this is what kind of constituted like an erotic thriller in 1992. You, you would genuinely watch this in the middle of the day on telly by today's standards. Okay, something you can listen to any time is your great podcast, of course, off screen. No Rebecca Perfect, I think, for a couple of weeks. What's, what's on off screen for the next couple of weeks? So it drops later on today, I think, your, your, your latest one. Yeah, 6 a.m. Every, every Friday, as always. Uh, my good friend Zara Phelan is filling in for the X while she's, uh, while she's off in NYC, sunning it up and conquering the world of NFTs one chip at a time. I don't know how NFCs work. I assume there's a chip involved somewhere. But, uh, yes, yeah, so we've got Zara Phelan filling in. This year we're covering Lightyear and a movie I think you would really like, Paul. Emma Thompson's new sex comedy, Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, which is heartbreaking and hilarious in equal measure. Believe me, there's no laughing measure. All good there's, podcast there's, platforms. There's no laughing matter about sex in the Ross household. Let me say that to you. So it's off screen, available all good podcast providers and some mediocre ones. Me and my van is back with us next Friday, of course. Coming up, the weather from Becky Sharp at the Met Office. And after that, Paul Coit for the last time this week with details of his early sports breakfast.